my name is Vahid Chitsos, part of the Elite Mastermind Group. Uh, this is where we talk about Dr. Hill's principles and philosophies. So good to have you here this morning. Go ahead and share with everybody where you're coming in from and introduce yourself, please. All right, all right. I'm Haley Hurd, and on Instagram, I'm Decide Today to Live, which I think goes very well with this. And um, <clears throat> I'm calling or I'm living in from Texas, Fort Hood, Texas area. Copper's Cove is actually my little town I'm in. We're actually from Louisiana, and we've lived in New Jersey, Washington State, and even in the Middle East and Qatar. So did that awesome. for a couple of years. I even had a baby there on Christmas Eve in a Muslim government hospital. <laughs> so, that yeah. Awesome. That is awesome. That's yeah. so cool. So let's dive into it. That's a lot of traveling. Are you planning on doing any more? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we love it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, my sister is in Houston, so... I'm not a big fan of Texas, but it's all right. I don't know if I could do the humidity all day, all year round. So yeah. I'm going to stick to Los Angeles for right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's dive into it. Thinking Grow It, Napoleon Hill's Principles and Philosophies. When did you get introduced and how are you utilizing it today? Well, very interesting. I'm probably a little unique to a lot of your interviewees. I've seen some of them and they're all wonderful. Um, basically, I did get introduced to it back when I was first starting to discover personal growth a bit. Uh, I'd say probably about eight years ago, something like that, maybe. And I'm 42 now, just so you know. I had that last baby in the Middle East when I was 40 years old. But anyway, side note. But um, with that, I didn't ever feel like it at the time was something for me because, and I didn't read it at the time either, because in the title about rich, of course, I want to be financially free and I want to be able to live and give like nobody else. But at the same time, I'm not about, you know, rich and that kind of lifestyle necessarily. Also, I had over time as I was kind of picking up on things about it, I, I did realize that there's probably some things in it I may not agree with, but that doesn't mean I shouldn't read it and glean from it. Um, however, I just never got around to it. So what was really cool is that your team reached out to me and asked me if I'd like to be interviewed about it. Well, that was my swift kick in the pants that said, okay, it's time to do it. <laughs> so I got on the fast train. I'm a stay-at-home homeschool mom of three kids, a toddler, a preschooler, and a teenager. And they're always around me except this week and next week. You're lucky because they're not here with me. It's a silent house. My husband's at work. <laughs> Very nice. But typically, I don't get to do actual reading anymore of books, even though I am a book author myself. Um, and I do love them. But I do listen to Audible books like nobody's business and YouTube videos and Instagram videos. But Audible is my favorite. And so I immediately went and got it on Audible, and there is an excellent, excellent recording of it. It's actually from a tape series from years ago, and it's wonderful. It even has clips of Napoleon Hill speaking himself live. Uh, that was really neat. And so I just finished that last night officially. <laughs> and in the meantime, I ordered from Amazon a copy that I got in the mail just as I got back from vacation this weekend. So I looked through that. Uh, on my trip back, actually, from my in-law's house and read what I could in that. And it's actually an updated version, so it has some newer stories in it, too, which is pretty neat. Um, so that's my reading level of it <laughs> and my exposure. So, okay, so that's fantastic. So I love that. So let me ask you a question. As a brand-new reader that just read it, uh, obviously, you know, the materials are timeless. You've heard of it. A lot of people have utilized the book for their success. But here's my question. When you read it, what were the couple of things that popped out to you immediately where you're like, this is different than other books that I've read? Or what were the things that you're like, wow, I didn't know this guy talked about this almost a hundred, almost a century ago, and it's still valid today. So tell us about a couple of those pointers that you picked out. Absolutely. I definitely gleaned a lot from it. Um, definitely resonated with a whole lot of things, definitely. So a uh, couple of things really briefly of uh, some of the things he's got that you know the step to, with faith and that obviously resonates with me as a christian um actually i have a book coming out very soon in the next few weeks called when i am afraid 31 days of faith over fear i already had that in the works before this interview was set up and before reading this book it's all god he puts everything together on purpose and then auto suggestion um, you know, that's where I kind of differ in some ways, but not fully. You know, I do believe that you should talk to yourself. You should. And what we say, our words and our thoughts highly influence 
everything in our life. Um, I personally feel that they should be those thoughts and words should be ones of truth. And so that's actually my first published book that recently came out. It sold um, almost 80 copies in a month. And I'm real excited about that. It's called Word of God Speak, Affirmations of Truth for Your Soul. So that right there, I give people affirmations that I have gleaned through Scripture, and I give them Scripture in it, too, that go along with it. But I've actually written affirmations for people to be able to use and speak and think uh, to help you get in the right mindset, because that's absolutely necessary. And then, of course, organized planning. I love to plan. These days with those kids, I'm not good at it. <laughs> implementation is where I fail and actually my word for the year of 2019 because I do a word every year for several years now is implement <laughs> because that's where I fall out especially with all the kid distractions around me and things it's just but I got to quit with the excuses I got to do it and I'm starting to do that um, but the two things I would say that really stood out to me the most as far as chapters and things like that go one would be decision of course, my Instagram handle for so many years has been Decide Today to Live, and it's on Twitter. Before it was even Instagram, it was Decide Today. It's on Pinterest. It's everywhere. I'm on Facebook, all of it. That's a big deal to me. <laughs> you need to make a decision. Uh, basically, actually, my first blog was and still is to not decide is to decide. You cannot uh, not make a decision. You've done that by not making a decision. So, and Beyond that, you have to act on your decisions, which, of course, he goes into as well. Um, I'm very bad at procrastinating, <laughs> and he talks about that right at the very beginning of that, and I'm trying to get better at not doing that. Uh, talks about how you need to quickly, and this is a neat concept, quickly, good leaders, quickly and firmly reach decisions, and they don't change them very quickly mm -hmm. afterward. I love that. I'll skip there. I thought I had it on do not disturb. <laughs> and then, oh, the story about the Declaration of Independence, how if there had been no decision, we would not have independence in this country, period. And it goes for our lives. If we do not make a decision, we will not be free, whether it's financially or emotionally, all the things. Um, it's so important. And then um, I had a couple of quotes that I really wanted to share, too, in the book. Um, there's one right there on page 160 of my book. Tell the world what you intend to do, but first show it. That's very important. And then uh, on page 170 of my book, there was another quote. And it said that the world has the habit of making room for people whose words and actions show they know where they're going. So your words and your actions show, and the world, the world will make room for you. It's going to happen. So just do it and say it and do it. Don't just say it. And at the end, decide, organize, plan, and act. Very important um, to do that as well, just to plan and act. And that is also then um, in, my, in my book, the man actually added a story about the man who founded FedEx in the decision chapter at the end of it. Very, right. very interesting story, just talking about how he made a decision, he stuck with it, he did not waver, even in the times of failure in the beginning, even when people said no, 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 and and he, you know now what FedEx is, it's a, ma a major mm -hmm. giant, right? So, and then the next chapter, I think, yeah, persistence was a huge one for me. Uh, I feel like I'm pretty persistent, but there are times when I waver with that too. And it also reminded me some of that, sec that chapter reminded me of Simon Sinek talking about your why, um, how important it is to know why you're doing this. It's not just because, just for no reason. You're not going to get there if you don't have that carrot dangling in front of you that's very realistic and very attainable. Um, and then... In that chapter, one other thing, too, or a couple of the things it said was, um, with persistence will come success. And then there's no substitute for persistence. Uh, it can't be supplanted by any other quality. Every failure brings with it the seed of an equivalent advantage. I really liked that. And uh, some people, <laughs> I like this, uh, we see the few who take the punishment of defeat as an urge to greater effort. I want to be that person who does that. Mm -hmm. And these fortunately never learn to accept life's reverse gear. And that was a really cool way to say that. You know, life can put you in a reverse gear really easily, but I won't accept that. I'm not going to, and I'm just going to keep going forward. I, a lot of things in that chapter, too, touched on scarcity versus abundance mindset. In his terms, that was poverty consciousness versus 
money consciousness. Um, for me lately, that's been a lot of scarcity versus abundance. I've really been digging into that, and I love that. So just a lot of really, really tangible things. And I want to bring up. I want to bring up your attention to page six, if you got that copy. Yes, that's the one I have. Page six. So it's the last two paragraphs. Okay. And it says, it says, before success comes. Okay, yes. Got it. That's, to me, that that was for almost two years. That's all I focused on. Because yeah. I think a lot of people or a lot of individuals that I know about their business and I have interacted with them, that's that could be the key for many of them to right. get them to the first million dollars. And yeah. the reason why I put a dollar amount to it is right. because I want to emphasize the importance of it. That it says before success comes to most people, they are sure to meet with much temporary defeat and perhaps some failure. When yeah. faced with defeat, the easiest and the most logical thing to do is to quit. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what the majority of people do. It is. And I've done that a bunch, but I'm not anymore. And, and, and you could see that, it, you know, the, the, the quit, it's italicized. You yes. could see that in, in a, so I pay attention to these little things in the book. Obviously, right. all the books have them, but right. that's where it comes that, you know, I think that has to do with persistence. That has to do with implementation. That has to do with decision. That has to do with you having your faith together. That has to do with specialized knowledge. That has, that just summarizes right there. As long as you don't, give up, which is the true definition of failure. As right. long as you don't give up, things are going to turn out to be okay. That's right. it. Like it's just the way it is. <laughs> Always fail forward. That's another big thing. You know, it's, we all fail. All the biggest leaders have just failed more, you know, and bigger. <laughs> and so and, that's, and that's another thing that I was talking to an NLP practitioner and we were going back and forth. So I'm going to change my vocabulary. When I say failure, because of my background, personal background, right. a lot of times that individuals, the way I learned it, failure is not equivalent to something good. So I have to always catch myself that, okay, failure to success is a good thing. So I need to come up with another word that I got to change my vocabulary because a lot of times I associate failure with negative thoughts. Right. You know, things going down, things going yeah. south, things are... You know, shit is happening is bad. You know, that's what failure is, right? So yeah. I gotta. Like that's, opportunity. It's an opportunity. Exactly. For exactly. <laughs> so a lot of us are programmed in the wrong way and we constantly want to change our results, but we don't get the concept. We're not internalizing the concept that it's not the result, it's the programming. Yes. If I change the programming, the results will change automatically. But a lot of people want to change the result. That doesn't necessarily work. You got to change the program, and this book will help you yes. reprogram. It won't happen overnight. Right. Just because you read it one time doesn't mean it's going to happen. No. You know, a lot of people read a lot of books, and nothing happens to them. But I think implementation, and Absolutely. you know where the informations are, where you could go back and kind of, yeah. you know, I, I feel like every chapter will take you a year. That's oh, the yeah. way I look at it. Oh, yeah. It's not just let me read it and go through it and just get a lot of good ideas. That's not going to do anything. You read it the first couple of times, but then you're like, okay, I'm going to pick this chapter and I'm going to really implement yes. everything there is to know about it. And then yeah. once you do that, you move on to the next one. And to me, it's like, I don't need to go from zero to hero overnight. No. I, I, I like this gradual movement to get to the end result because anything that's worth having comes through time. Yes. I don't think it's an instantaneous gratification that a lot of us are programmed for. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about your kids. Why, why, why homeschool? Why homeschool? Well, it was in a way forced on us when we moved to the Middle East, uh, when we moved to Qatar. That's kind of the way things go there. You either get provided a good education budget through your, um, your job, which my husband worked for their government as an Olympic uh, strength coach for their men's beach volleyball team, which went to Rio. He went with them traveled the world with them to compete until they got there. And so it was really cool. Uh, but working for their government um, didn't pay out a whole lot of money as far as extras. And so a lot of companies, when you go over there, American companies and otherwise pay an education, um, you know, stipend or budget, whatever, along with your salary. And we didn't get that. So people that were like us, 
it, whether you chose to homeschool or not, that was kind of your only option because the public schools there were for the locals and a few of the other, you know, um, expat type of groups there, but not ours. So basically that was our only choice at that time, but it was something I'd always wanted to be able to do. I've, I'm an RN and I've always been the one to bring in double what my husband does and our health care and all the stuff. And so this was our first opportunity for him to take over and do all of that. And he's done a wonderful job with it. Um, and so, but it's still a big step of faith, you know, for me to step out of the work world. I was in the corporate world. I was making six figures. I was traveling all kinds of things. And I stepped away from all of that to go with this and move over there to a foreign country. And he was there a year before we came, we were there for two years. And so all together, he was there for three, but, um, anyway, that was what got us into homeschool. But like I said, I've always had the heart to do it. I've always studied about it. And even on my blog, I used to review books that were, Christian homeschool publishing company books. I, I reviewed for a whole bunch of different publishers and got tons of free books, awesome books. So I still have those. And now I get to actually use them, especially we, ha we waited nine years after our first child to have our second. I was 38 when we had our second and then 40 when we had our third. And <laughs> I was in my late 20s That's when so we had good. our first. <laughs> so RN to homeschooling. That would be a good title for the book. I already see the videos blowing up, going viral. I could right? totally see that. <laughs> with the catchy line right there. So that's cool. So let me ask you a question. Tell me two things that you loved about being a, a nurse. Two things I loved. Of course, I got into it for the people, to care for people. That's my heart. Uh, I don't know if you can pick up on that at all yet about me, but I do. I love people. I resonate with people. I, I can even read people and, and relate with them really well, even if it's someone that normally people don't get along with very well, you know, it's just kind of who I am. So I have a big heart for people. That was a big thing. And then um, I'm as much as I hated math in school, <laughs> I, you have to use a lot of math in nursing, of course. And I actually am very good and intrigued at and by science and math and all the things now. Uh, I really just love and I love sharing that knowledge that I have with others. And as a nurse, you do train other nurses, you teach your patients, you just are constantly teaching. And so it's our, our motto is see one, do one, teach one. We see it, we do it, and then we go turn around and teach it to somebody. And that's how we do things. And so those are some things I, I did love about being a nurse and becoming one. And I'll, one of the most I'm, difficult I'm, things I'm, about actually, being a nurse. Yeah, I actually have a Louisiana and a Texas license, uh, active license, even though I don't practice currently. I do use that. I'm actually a writer for a, a major medical company that uh, houses journals for um, nursing and allied health professionals and other sports performance type professionals and all. Um, but anyway, I have a, a license. I've been a nurse now for 17 years. <laughs> so, what are the two most difficult things about being a nurse? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> one thing is the documentation and all the regulations behind the, you know, all the things you have to make sure to document and in time and all the things like that. So that can be, uh, it takes you away from what you went into nursing for from the bedside itself and caring for the patient and, and um, relating with the patient and their family. Uh, I've been adult and pediatric, intensive care, trauma, all of it, level one trauma, everything. But uh, so, yeah, t that kind of the regulation stuff and the, the paperwork stuff really takes you away from where your heart was. And it, and it makes you cynical and kind of like, you know, lose your, your fire for it, your burnout, you know. And um, I don't know. A lot of people are, they call it trauma drama. They love like the drama and the, they really thrive and do well in and I'm a very, I do well in pressure environments. I do better under pressure than I, than I do otherwise. However, in that world of critical care and life and death in my hands, literally, I kind of got burnout on that responsibility on my head all the time. I still have from, I don't know, 15 years ago, tender memories of, of very critical moments with patients, ones that died, ones that almost died whether it was my fault or I just felt like it was partially or whatever, it just, or even if I knew it wasn't still, it's just not an easy thing to have uh, to live with. And I still, I still have memories today from that. I agree with that. When my wife was giving birth, um, I, I, I came close to interacting with all these nurses and it's not easy. It's, uh, it's 12 hours of legit hard work, intense. You need to be alert. 
Yeah. You gotta, you gotta have a clean head. You're dealing with all types of people, and most of the time, most of the time, they're in pain. Oh, yeah. So you gotta have extra patience. So it's a, it's a lot of, uh, it's, the, it, it's very taxing on yeah. the nurses and the doctors. But I feel like the nurses did more. Just don't tell all the doctors; they don't like it when I say that. I feel like nurses did a lot more, and I feel what like some of the nurses knew more than the doctor. But that's I don't know if that's true all the time. But I was more fun of the nurses than the doctor. The doctor was like only like two, three minutes. It, you know, it was it wasn't the interaction. This it was like, okay, you know, this is yeah. the big guy. This is supposed to make sure everything is okay, and I only talked to him three minutes, versus I had a full blown conversation with the nurse for like twenty minutes. So mm -hmm. it's definitely. Um, I got to see that when when she gave right. birth. So I try to stay away from hospitals as yeah. much as possible. So I love them, but I want to stay away. Yeah, um, as I was a nurse mostly in my bedside days and in my educator nurse educator days at teaching hospitals. One specific one that was a state government hospital, um, and so we worked with literally brand new doctors, even student doctors, <clears throat> a lot. And so in those cases, especially, we did know more than them and we did tell them what to do. And if they would listen, it was a good thing. And there were times when they didn't want to. There are a lot of very intelligent and very uh, involved doctors. But then you're right. There are we're, nurses are there 24 seven. Some doctors are, of course, when they're on call and things like that. But nurses are literally at the bedside all the time and for long shifts. And so it, it, we do get very involved with the patients and their families. I love it. I love it. Listen, I want to thank you so much for taking this time and being here. I appreciate you to you sharing with us and, and reading this as fast as you could so okay. you can share. But definitely keep in contact with us. Let us know if you find anything that's, that we didn't share so we can bring you back and we can kind of share. Um, hopefully you will add this to the reading for, for homeschooling the kids. Um, yes. I think this will be a new regimen, new book that they need to be doing, not by choice, by force. They need yeah. to read this, and uh, that will be a good, good, good report for us. And maybe we can get them on a live video to see what they learn from them reading it. At different yeah. age, you get different things, so that will be a good. It will be a good experiment to do. Right, and maybe I could even come up with an edit version of it that I do for kids. <laughs> Run, let's do it. That's it. Fantastic. But I want to thank you so much for being here. Definitely say hello to the husband. Will do. Thank you. Talk to you Bye. later. Bye bye. Bye bye.